to God be the glory. In my office are five smooth stones that I picked out of a bed of a brook that was in the Valley of Elah. Five smooth stones that might have been just like the ones that David picked up when he fought Goliath that day. Before he was a king, he was a shepherd. Let's learn from David and the sheepfolds. Everyone loves a rags to riches story. Our world tells us we can be anything we want to be. We can accomplish anything we put our minds to. But what's often left out of that encouragement is what it takes to ascend to the top, what it takes to be great. And that often begins with service, starting with working in obscurity, starting with doing the lowest job that doesn't get much fanfare and ultimately ascending to the heights of greatness. Neil, you know, greatness is something that many people strive for and want to attain to. But in the Bible, God says we should approach greatness from a different vantage point. There are many characters throughout Scripture who start out in humble ways and serving in what appear to be, at least initially, a menial task and ultimately least exaltation in their lives. That's right. That kind of reminds me of the old story of an elite performer who was asked, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Or the old adage, practice makes perfect. It seems to me that so often God is preparing us for the service that He wants us to do in His kingdom by the things that have gone before. And how have we handled those doors of opportunity that He's placed in front of us? And it's, it's an honest fact that sometimes we fail in that and God's not going to give us those greater opportunities because we've not been faithful stewards in what He's put in our path. That's right. You think about people in the Bible that God called to his service. You think about people like Abraham or Moses to lead an entire nation of people. And it started out as just seeing who they were and the types of character that they had. And God saw more often in them than they initially saw in themselves or the prophetic call of Jeremiah or Isaiah or Saul of Tarsus. You name it. God saying to people, I want you to do great things. But we got to back up first and see how these people lived their lives and who they were. I think about a lot of great Old Testament characters and New Testament. Does anybody come to mind for you? Sure. So let's set, uh, set the stage for this. There's Moses who tried to lead the people of God and the children of Israel, but the people did not prepare themselves and live as they should. This is followed immediately by Joshua, a leader who uh, led the people of God in by God's power to conquer the land of Canaan. And they, uh, that was really a great time in their history. And Joshua rose up, but there were no leaders behind him who could follow up on his success. And for 300 years, you have the period of the judges. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. It was at the end of that period that Samuel was approached by the people. And they said, we want a king to be like the nations all around us. Your sons are not living in a faithful way. And so Samuel, after discussing this with God, uh, God says, give them what they want. And there's a man who comes to the throne. His name is Saul. Saul's the first king of all Israel. And Saul begins so humbly. God hands him this great responsibility. And at first it goes great. But pretty soon you can tell that Saul has not really been keeping himself prepared. He's not been uh, following up on the, the great raw potential that's there. And as a result of that, God in 1 Samuel 15 through uh, the words of Samuel says, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to somebody else, a man after my own heart. God says that Saul had failed. And so in his place, God always is ready to raise somebody else up that can do the things that God would have them to be and do. You talked about a man after God's own heart. In 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14, that's how God describes David as a man after his own heart. And he even says, He's a man better than Saul. Now, what made David better than Saul? God's no respecter of persons. God shows no partiality, meaning God doesn't look on anybody's face and see inherent value in them over and above anybody else or play favorites. So what was it about David that exalted him and made him a better king ultimately than Saul? Well, a place for us to start is in the books of First and Second Chronicles, which are written especially to the, the, the tribe of Judah to appreciate the, the lineage through whom Jesus, the Savior, is going to ultimately come. And there's a, there's a little section there that tells us about that difference. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10, in verse 13, and it goes on into chapter 11, 
Um, here's what the record of Scripture says. It says, So Saul died for his trespass, which he committed against the Lord because of the word of the Lord, which he did not keep. Okay, he fails in what God's placed in front of him. And also because he asked counsel of a medium, making inquiry of it, and did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom to David the son of Jesse. All right, he failed in the opportunity out in front of him. He had not prepared himself. He sinned, and so God says, I'm going to give it to David. Chapter 11 says, Then all Israel gathered to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord your God said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall be prince over my people Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and, made, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel, according to the word of the Lord through Samuel. There's a word that's used to describe his kingship that really fits with who David is as a person. He says that you're going to shepherd Israel not lead, administrate, which he does those things. But isn't it interesting that he would use the term shepherd? That's right. David has been called by some people the original Renaissance man. He was a poet. He was a warrior. He was a king. But he was before all of those things just a shepherd. And I don't say just a shepherd as if it's insignificant or unimportant, but that's where David's life began, and that's what God calls him and when you look back at his life, you can learn some things about the shepherd that led to him being the great psalmist of Israel, the great king and the great warrior that led Israel in and out of battle and conquered his ten thousands. It all started with his humble beginnings as a shepherd. And isn't it in that that we learn some lessons about service and about greatness and about being the person that God would have us to be? Absolutely. And, and I think what will serve us well in seeing some of those attributes is to go back to those days before he was a king and to learn some of the ways that he capitalized on both the abilities that God gave him, the resources and opportunities that were placed into his hands, and how the victories in those things led to greater uh, opportunities for service that culminates in his being the king of Israel. So if we go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel especially chapter 16 and 17, I think we're going to see a lot of those characteristics rise to the top. That's right. Right after Saul, you mentioned Saul first in 1 Samuel 15, God tells Saul, I'm done with you. I'm tearing the kingdom out of your hands. And then in chapter 16, we're introduced to David. The one in verse 7, God says, I don't see like man sees. I look on the heart. Samuel's gone to the household of Jesse. And let's notice verse 11 and what he, what we learn about David in the initial phase is Samuel is looking among the sons of Jesse. Verse 11 says, then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Okay, so the first thing we see is David learned relationships in the sheepfolds. Everything we're going to see is that David first practiced and did something when he was the shepherd of sheep. And we're going to see that show up later in David's reign. And so David has an obvious relationship with the sheep here that it causes him to be devoted to them and to demonstrate the, a care and compassion for them. Well, you're going to see that often in David's um, uh, reign and his rule and in the relationships that follow. Maybe you think about just a few chapters after this as Saul is uh, king. You're going to see and he continues to reign as king until his death at the end of the book of 1 Samuel that David treasures the relationship that he has with Jonathan. You know, where did he learn such faithfulness and loyalty to a friend and to really be a dedicated person in relationship? Well, perhaps at least in some way it was in that interaction with the sheep. It's what his father had given him charge over, it seems. And David, he takes this on fully and it shapes him into the person that he would later become. You know, David's son Solomon wrote much of the book of Proverbs, and Solomon says one of the Proverbs that high man treats his beast tells you a lot about him. And if you disrespect them, then God's going to exact punishment on you because they are created by God as well. David's interaction with the sheep is more than mere babysitting. It's given him the tools and the equipment that he'll need later in his interaction with humanity. And this idea of the shepherd that you talked about from First Chronicles, it really shows up and what David does initially, and what he'll later do with tens of thousands of Israelites. That's right. Solomon said that friend loves at all times. 
and a brother is born for adversity. Where did Solomon learn that? He's inspired of God, but perhaps he saw that in David's public life and how he was so good in the relationships that he would need that in, in his serving as a king. Uh, even though he was a man of war, there was internal peace. Uh, and when there wasn't, like in the first seven years of his reign, uh, David has a skill set to help them to navigate through all of that. And it was also because of the, the most important relationship of his life. He trusted God so completely, uh, so intimately, uh, and he reflects that in some of his writings. You said he was the poet of Israel, the great songwriter of all the Psalms that he wrote. And there's some great ones. Psalm chapter one, kind of the one that sets the, the, the tone for all the other Psalms or Psalm 119, which is such a thorough honoring of the word of God. What everybody knows, if they don't know anything beyond John 316, they might know Psalm 23. And it, it, that Psalm is above all else, a Psalm about relationship. It, it's from two perspectives. It's about the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. But if you'll go through that psalm, you also see it as the sheep psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. But however you look at that, it's a psalm about relationship. David, while he's tending the sheep, is learning about the most important relationship of all. And it's going to serve him later in life. Though he's going to make mistakes, he's going to sin in egregious ways. He leans throughout his life on the relationship that must have began when he was a shepherd of sheep. You know, we talk about greatness and how you ascend the ladder and what it means to be a great servant. And sometimes we might think of things as sort of a stepping stone. And if David wasn't careful, he could have viewed his taking care of the sheep in that way. Well, maybe this is just a stepping stone until something greater comes along for me. But that's not the David that we find in Scripture, is it? He yeah. starts with those relationships, treating those sheep like he would later treat people and like we all should. And it transforms him and changes him. But what else do we see in David's life that helps us to see his greatness and service? Well, I think you see in David a sense of responsibility um, that causes him to be faithful to the task that was in front of him. And the task grew greater. And as they grew greater, David proved equal to those tasks because of a principle of a reliability of faithfulness um, that to shine through his character. So if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, about verse 15, when the fevered pitch of the battle is going on, and you have Goliath on one side, and we're going to see a lot more about him, and you have uh, Israel cowering right behind their king, Saul, who's cowering. Nobody's taking him on. Uh, David's going back and forth. So if you look in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 15. It says, But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. All right. So here you have David who is um, interested in the battle. His older brothers are there. Uh, and he, he wants to see Israel gain this victory and, and not uh, succumb to this heathen, this idolatrous nation, the Philistines. Uh, and yet he realizes back home, they're sheep. And if he's either giving it into the hands of somebody else, he's entrusting, he's delegating. But if that can't happen, he's going to go back home and the, to that distance and he's going to take care of those sheep. You know, there's something to be said about somebody who is, is responsible and you can trust them to handle what's given into their hands. Reminds me of Jesus in the parables of preparation. Uh, you remember in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, you have this parable of the talents. And one man is given five talents and one man's given two talents and one man's given one. And the one talent man is not judged because he only had one talent. And he's not judged harshly because he didn't have two and he didn't have five. But at the, at the, uh, the bottom line of that parable is when the Lord comes back, his master comes back to give an account, he's not been faithful with what's been given into his hand. That's right. The wisdom literature of Old Testament Israel teaches us that we should be faithful with what's been put in our hands. Solomon, again, in Ecclesiastes, though, in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 9, he says, Whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. There's no work or labor or toil in the grave where you're headed. Solomon's point is, when God's entrusted you with a responsibility, you're to give it all you've got. There are no do-overs after this life. And David did that with the sheep. You think about Jesus' resolve. 
in John chapter 9, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's yet day because the night's coming when no man can work. David realized that, yes, I would love to be involved in this battle. But David didn't initially have his mind on going into battle, defeating Goliath, ascending to kingship, and having his name ring out through the annals of history. David said, you know what? The greatest task is the first task I've been assigned, the one right ahead of me. I can do that, and I can be great in small things, and wherever that leads me, that's where I'll go. But David was faithful in those little things, which ultimately led to him being faithful later on in much. That's right. You know, I, I imagine if you sat down a, a, a room full of little children uh, of a certain age and you say, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know, but I've never heard too many people say, well, I'd love to be the street sweeper. Or I'd love to be the one that collects the garbage. You know, we usually, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a, a firefighter. It's a great and honorable uh, task. Or I want to be president of the United States. But if the lot in life that falls to us is that we are the street sweeper and the garbage collector, we want to do our very best job in that. And the idea is, back to the parable of, of the talents, um, you know, if you're whoever has, to him will be given. And the one that does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. God wants us to be faithful in what's put into our hands. And David demonstrates that all the way back to the time in which he was the shepherd boy of Israel. That's right. You bring up that example about little children. And I think, you know, when you look at David's life in view of that, we don't know where we're going to be. But maybe instead of wondering what we're going to be when we grow up, we should be thinking more about who we're going to be when we grow up. That's and true. David was more concerned with who he was going to eventually be. And God was able to look into his heart and he said, I can work with this individual. I can work with him because he has the kind of heart that will be molded by me and transformed by what he's doing in this service just to sheep. David hadn't even dealt, as far as we're reading so far, with interacting with people or showing the leadership characteristics that you might look for in a military general or in a statesman, but he had it all the time because of how he interacted with the first responsibility that he was given. But That's what right. else does David show us? Well, let's stay in this chapter. And in fact, we can just stay in this chapter for the rest of the time. David comes down to see the battle. And when David gets there, um, He's got brothers who his father is sent to, to tend to and to feed and so forth. And it's what happens, especially with Eliab, his brother, that is so helpful for us if we're looking uh, to be of greater service to God because of an inevitability that comes in being trying to be a servant of God. So if you look at chapter 17, begin reading at verse 28 there and see what's said down to verse 30. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. All right, so there's several things that we learn about criticism and we know David's properly uh, motivated, but he comes down here and Eliab sees him poking his nose where he, Eliab, thinks it doesn't belong. And we learn several things about criticism. What we need to be reminded of when we're trying to serve God is that criticism can come from those who are closest to us. You know, it, it can come from a very unlikely place. This is David's own flesh and blood, his own brother. And yet, as he's trying to do what's right, he faces a criticism, uh, and, when, and when we find ourselves trying to serve the Lord, it may come, that criticism may come from the people who are the closest to us. Would it be safe to say that criticism is inevitable? You think about all of the great people that serve God in the Bible, and none of them escape without criticism. You think about Moses, that great leader, the man of God, and even his own family. In Numbers 12, Miriam and Aaron, do you think God only speaks by you, Moses? We've got power too. Or Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16, and they say, well, you, you guys think you can select the priesthood, Moses. We've got abilities. We're special people too. We can do great things. You move over into the New Testament, and Jesus is criticized. He's called a worker of demons and the prince of demons is fueling his ministry. Or Paul's not a genuine apostle. He's a fake. Nehemiah tries to build the wall and they say, well, if a fox runs up that wall, it'll come down. It's really not worth much. Everybody that tried to do something great for God met opposition and criticism. And the difference between the faithful and the failures were those who finished, those who persisted and went on no matter what others said. And I think we see that with David here. Yeah. His own brother says, you've come with ill motives. You're just getting in the business. Go back to your sheep. You shouldn't be involved. 
And how does David respond? Well, he looks at this situation and he says, I, basically, my motivation is right. I care about the success that, that is going to come in this battle. I don't want the enemies of God to, to trumpet, trumple uh, on top of and to defeat God's people because we have God on our side. So that criticism can come from somebody close to us, but we often find that that criticism is uncharitable. Hmm. Um, he demeans him. He says, you know, what about those few sheep? Why don't you go and take care of those? Don't, don't you worry about big man business. You go take care of that little boy business that you have. So often we'll find that people are unrighteously judging our motives, um, our, our desire to be engaged and involved, and that's certainly what happens here. But we also find that this criticism can be laced with unrighteous judgment. Um, what Eliab incorrectly says is, is, I know what's in your heart. And how often when we're trying to serve God to somebody say, oh, I know what you're, you're just in this for yourself, or you just want the attention of other people. Well, while Eliab is, is criticizing his heart, we've already mentioned on a few occasions, God says, this is the man after my own heart. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, God assesses David that way. You know, the old adage is, if you want to avoid criticism, simply say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. But if we're going to dare to do greatly for God, we can expect that criticism is going to come. David is still a shepherd boy. He's not yet a king. And he learned how to handle criticism in this sheepfold. Oh, by the way, is he going to face criticism as king? Almost constantly. From the division with Judah and the rest of the nation in the first seven years of his reign at Hebron, uh, or if it's the criticism of his own son that's going to lead to uh, a potential rift in the kingdom, it's just going to be a part of trying to lead for God. That's right. I think about criticism and accusations, and Jesus would obviously be at the top of that list. But what about Job? You think about Job's life and how his friends continue to say, Job, we know you've done wrong. We know you you must have sinned. You've done something that you shouldn't have done. You, you've you been corrupt. Your children deserve to die. You're being paid back for the things that you've done wrong. And Job was standing under that criticism and saying, no, I've been righteous. I've been pure. I've been holy. I don't know why these things have happened to me. But he was unjustly criticized. And just like David, it came from those who were closest to him, those who came initially to comfort, but eventually they criticized him and they continue to cut at his character until they just about destroy Job. But if we're going to be who God wants us to be, like David and like others, we're going to have to stand up against that criticism. Sometimes it's tempting to just sort of cower down, to shrivel up and just say, you know what, if this is how things are going to be, as I try to be the person God wants me to be, I resign faithfulness to God or involvement in my life and serving Him because I just can't make everybody happy. Well, then we can be encouraged by trying to see this from heaven's perspective. What's heaven's perspective with Job in Job chapter 42? Job was right. The friends were wrong. Moses and Miriam, God says, all right, Miriam, have your little case of leprosy here because of your unjust criticism. Or how about uh, Dathan and Abiram and Korah and that rebellion in number 16? Ground swallows up on, on top of them. Uh, throughout the Bible, God's saying, hey, critic, you've got a responsibility here too. And by the way, hey, you who are being criticized and doing what's right, realize I can see and I know what's right. Well, there's more uh, good lessons that we can learn from David in the sheepfold. If you'll think about um, David's courage and his valor, we'll see that uh, later on in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 34, if you'll read that for us. It says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb of the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So in, this, uh, in the past, it was lions and bears. Now, <laughs> I have great respect for anybody who can do that. I've been on safaris overseas, and I've seen lions, and I've seen what they can do. I lived in Colorado for several years, and they make the bears a little bit bigger and meaner over there. And David faces them down, and he defeats them. And so when you see him against Goliath, he doesn't just stare him off. He runs toward him, and he, and he, he takes him on, and that's going to serve him well when he's king because... He is going to lead Israel into battle over and over again, leaning on God's help, and they're going to defeat some much more powerful and bigger enemies. But he learned that courage and valor 
in those little one-on-one situations before. And he kept them at the ready for recall. He was able to look back on past victories and say basically to himself, same God, different foe. The same God that delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from Goliath. All giants are the same size to God. They all eventually fall. That's what David realized, just like Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. He says, God delivered us from so great a death. He does deliver, and we've set our hope on him that he'll deliver us again. Those small victories that we win in, in the dark help us in the big moments, and that's what we see with David. That's right. And alongside of this, David also learns faith in the sheep folds. He says, the God that has delivered me from then will deliver me from you. Put yourself in his shoes. Here he is, maybe, you know, not quite half the size of the enemy that he's facing. Someone huge, a man who's a, been a warrior from his youth. David is but a youth. But David didn't see that. He saw God, and he realized that God was more than the equalizer. He was the one that gives the victory. You know, when you quote in Romans 8, verse 37, uh, verse 36 is a quotation from the Psalms. David saw God in that way as the one who was able to help him to win. David believed that he could be victorious because he had God on his side. David was also resourceful though, wasn't he? He was. He had the sling, he had the wallet, and he, he had the, the, the stones. He, he was prepared, he had more stones than he needed, but he collected, he knew he might need more. And that resourcefulness is going to serve him all the way out when he was the king of Israel and the resource that he needed most was what he got from God in his devotional life, in his reverence for God's word, and his trust in God's ability to win. You know, there's a lot more we could say about David. He reigned as king over Israel for 40 years, but it all started in the sheepfold. And what he did in the sheepfold eventually catapulted him to the throne as he was a man after God's own heart. God would have each of us to be great and to dare to do great things for him. We can be anything that God would have us to be. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But great greatness in God's eyes starts with great service. If we would be servants, if we would be humble and be the people that God wants us to be, like David, we must use what we have before us, lean on God for help, and be bold and courageous.